Right. It is my pleasure today to introduce Dr. Aaron Kalapari, who is an assistant professor, at least for the moment, at Vanderbilt University School of Medicine in the Department of Pharmacology, and she has a variety of other affiliations there as well. Dr. Kalapari, thank you so much for uh, agreeing to this interview. I am so excited. Um, I'm excited because you, when you asked me to do this, it was just like all I've been thinking about lately is how important behavior and like good behavior work is. And you and I both have our history of publishing is doing complex behavioral tasks and understanding how that affects the brain and how that fits together. And so this is like my favorite thing to talk about. So thanks for having me. <laughs> great. It's absolutely one of my favorite things to talk about as well. And you're a great person to have this conversation with. So um, maybe you can just kind of, um, we could start with the journal that we're um, kind of doing this for, Psychopharmacology now. Obviously the term psychopharmacology, it has two yeah. parts to it. Psychology is the first and pharmacology is the other. Um, and so it's a, you know, I think a journal that is long valued behavior. I'm curious if you could just give your thoughts about the, about the journal or about um, you know, where it's been or where it's kind of going in terms of um, this, this topic. Yeah, so I, I love this journal. So, you know, it's, it's funny, like there's been this like explosion of all of these new technologies coming out lately. We can image cells, we can manipulate them, we can sequence them, we can figure all this out. And I feel like all of these neuroscientists have been like, look at all this cool stuff we can do, but what does it mean? And I feel like it's kind of bringing us back around to, to understand the brain and to understand how the brain controls any sort of behavior disease. We need to understand fundamental aspects of behavior. And so, you know, my early work when I was in graduate school, I was working in two different labs. Um, one was with Sarah Jones, but the other one was with Dave Roberts. So Dave Roberts is a guy that's a reinforcement guy and his entire lab was only opera boxes, nothing else. He did not have any other techniques. And so I got to watch this brilliant lab design and ask questions with opera. And by the way, these opera boxes weren't like Met Associates opera boxes. They had one lever. That's it. One lever, the animals lived in the cage. There were no cues other than like the context. And that was it. And this man had an insanely successful career defining what animals, how they took drugs, what factors controlled drugs on a behavioral, drug taking on a behavioral level, and how this contributed to the development of different kinds of phenotypes associated with addiction. Only behavior. And he's got some of the most impactful papers in our field. And most of them, are in journals like psychopharmacology. And so I'm so excited to kind of see the field have this like kind of new found appreciation for what behavior means, but also start to kind of see this boom in journals like this, where you have experts reviewing these, these papers and your new models and what you're doing in this rigorous way that helps your science get better. So I love it because I love the reviewers because they are some of the ones that give me the most insightful feedback on our behavioral tasks or behavioral designs. And sometimes they're tough, but they're usually right. It pains me to say that, but they're usually right. And I think that I love this journal because everything I've ever done at the journal has made the work in my lab better. Yeah, I've always had a really positive review experience. And I think a lot of that comes also from the top edit the you know, editors like Trevor Robbins, like Klaus Michek, um, and as well as the, you know, the new, new generation here, um, Chris Jobin Benoz yes. and uh, Chris Janik and so on. Um, are obviously going to keep us on that track. And, and I'm glad you brought up Dave Roberts. Um, you know, he's, as you mentioned, a, a person who does, you know, pretty much all behavior and, and obviously you learned well from him. Um, you know, and he really came up with some of the models that I think not just the sort of psychology oriented people like us are using, but, but you know, lots and lots of labs use. Like, I, yeah. you know, some of these behavioral economic models came out of, out of his lab. I think progressive ratio may have. Oh, he was the, uh, the original, uh, he wasn't the, first progressive ratio person, but he was the one that implemented the, uh, the exponential increasing um, ratios, the one that like everybody uses. Um, and so, and, and you know what he was doing? His work is actually, if you go back and read some of his early work, it's some of like the best work. How do you ma manipulate motivation? What are confounding factors that influence motivation? How does motivation change if animals have access to a drug taking and seeking lever so that they're not consuming drug on the same lever that they're pressing to actually get access to consume drug? And you start to see these really cool patterns develop. And what's really funny in my lab that's doing crazy recording tools, manipulations, is that understanding how to dissociate these behavioral variables, which by the way, requires a fundamental understanding behavior. 
helps us try understand what the brain does. So like if you have tasks where you have all these var variables conflated, the animal runs, it presses this, it looks at this all at the same time, you say, hey, these cells respond to this. And then you just like decide it's what you wanted it to be. But when you know that- Reward, maybe. Yeah, it's <laughs> reward. And, and you know, as a behavioral pharmacologist, I would argue who cares about reward? All I care about is what the stimulus does to behavior. Does the stimulus increase the behavior? Great, it's a reinforcer. Does it decrease behavior? Great, it's a punisher. I don't care if it's an appetitive or it's a reversive stimulus. They can support positive reinforcement too. And so it's just like a kind of cool thing to say, hey, I want to understand consumatory regulation of the brain. And I want to dissociate that from appetitive motivational circuits. You can do that with really cool behavior where you have animals pressing on one lever for access to some amount of drug on the other lever. Dave has this really cool paradigm that I, I more people should be using and I'm going to start using in my lab and I'm just now getting up and running with stuff like this. It's called the hold down procedure. So one of his fundamental ideas was that we, get, we say, how hard will you work for this dose of drug that I decided that you have access to, which is not what happens to humans, right? You don't say, hey, how hard will you work for this exact dose? You ask people, how motivated are you to seek out drug? And then they take however much they want. And so Dave created this task where the, how long the animal holds down the lever dictates the pump time. So animals get to choose their own doses. And so there's all kinds of great stuff that you can do with purely behavior that's super innovative, relates to human addiction, that looks at individual differences, sex differences, and how we take drug and why. And I don't think journals that are outside of the kind of psycho farm realm really appreciate that at the level that this journal does, which is what I get excited about. I see papers when I know they're going to be rigorous controls. People will do all of the controls and that's appreciated. It's not in the supplement. It's part of the manuscript. And so I don't know, it's like a fun, it's a fun way to think about science and to think about the, the fact that behavior in itself is a science. It's not just a random tool. Sure. And, you know, arguably that science is called psychology, or at least experimental psychology. Yeah, exactly. um, and I think that, you know, the reason why we not just be, you know, we're not just sort of, um, as some people sometimes say, like stamp collectors here, well, this set of neurons fires to this, and this set of neurons fires to this slightly different process that I managed to disentangle with my fancy behavioral task. Yeah. The reason why this matters is because the brain cares about this stuff. Like there are distinctions in, I mean, one, I think that's, that's pretty well established, including in psychopharmacology is like desire versus pleasure from reward learning versus being for, uh, versus like pleasure and, and so on. Like these are processes that are being computed by the brain differently. And if we just kind of lump them all together on a task that can't differentiate them, we're going to be potentially misleading ourselves. Yeah. And I think that that's, you know, when you look at some of these psychiatric disease states and you say, Hey, why don't we have great treatments yet when we have all these tools? I think some of it is because we manipulate things and we think we're manipulating something else but maybe it's not something you want to manipulate. I, I mean, my argument, and I could, I think other people have different opinions is that consumatory processes are, are kind of conserved. You consume food, you consume all of these resources. So just preventing animals from consuming things is likely to have really bad off target effects. But when you target things that are really separate, like you're saying like, motivation or but like motivation for drugs specifically you start to dissociate those and then you can get these more refined targets brain circuits are engaged that aren't engaged with other other kind of systems and so i don't know it's like it, and when you're talking about ways to do this the way that i like to do these things in my lab is think about behavioral how would i dissociate these behaviorally and before we go down this really big path of doing all the manipulations in the brain, we usually like to present papers and submit them to journals where we're going to have really rigorous psychology, behavioral pharmacology reviewers that are going to just focus on the behavioral task. Does this do what we think it does? Do the reviewers think it does? What other controls are we missing? And so it's, it's I think a really important step is to engage this kind of community to say like, hey, what do we think as a group is the best way to do this? And then really use those kind of tools and new models, which by the way, I think that there's been, you know, I think that a lot of models before this, we were talking about, you know, model development and how some models were developed in the seventies and we still use them today. I think it's time to start developing new models to assess, for example, sex specific behavioral strategies. A lot of our models were developed to model male specific behavior. And so you know, starting to focus again, coming back to this behavior and saying, how do we conceptualize 
female motivational drives. What is evolutionarily conserved? What would be the evolutionary basis of this? And how do we model what may be different between the sexes? It requires some pretty complex behavior only development studies. And I think that's going to be like the key to the next 20 years with all of these tools is can we develop new, better models that model these individual differences we see in humans and kind of take the behavior field forward with all of the flashy, flashing things? Yeah, that's a great point. Yeah. You got to look at your animals. I think is like what it comes down to. Oh man, look at your, can you, this is like the craziest thing to me. Like I used to sit in operant rooms and like just watch them do these behaviors. And you see crazy stuff. If you watch animals self-administer, like some animals will like think they need to touch the lever with their butt. So then they'll like do a circle and do this. And you see all these like stereotyped, like almost like superstitious behaviors. And so I've been excited about that kind of like boom and video tracking stuff. Not because I think sometimes people are using it to do what we could already do. Like if you're video tracking and we could do that and it's just motor, then I'm a little less excited about it. But the idea that like, yeah, maybe there's more going on if we actually watch the animals is such an important idea that I think students are starting to come around to again. Like it's cool to sit in the operant room in the dark and just watch animals do stuff. 100%. And I would just add a little small anecdote, which is that I, for this reason, have some pet rats as well. And yeah. what's fun about that is that, um, you know, they live in groups in a lo much yeah. larger, nicer environment than any of the rats in my lab do. And you notice some things about the rats um, right away. And the biggest one is individual differences. Yeah. So if I have, let's say, four female rats in a, in a large environment and I open the door, what do they do? Some of them hide. Some of them, you know, maybe I'll put some food or some yeah. different kinds of treats in there and stuff. Some of them will go straight to those. Other ones want to get out and explore. And it just pops out immediately. And this is something that I think we behavioral neuroscientists sometimes you know, we try to avoid looking at that yeah. because it makes our experiments more complicated and, you know, more, um, you need a bigger end and it's expensive, especially if you're doing fancy stuff on top of it. Uh, so I think there's a lot of value to just kind of putting your eyes on animals. And, and even, even if you have, you know, your deep lab cuts and you have all this sophisticated, you know, AI based analysis of whatever states are associated with neural firing or yeah. something like that. I still think someone going in there with just a curious mind and saying, why is this rat doing that? And this one's not maybe um, yeah. is an important question. I think it, my humble opinion is I think that the key to developing treatments is harnessing these individual differences. So like why, I think the big question in the addiction field is why have we been studying some of these things for, you know, 50, 60 years and we have no new treatments. I think part of that is some of like FDA hoops, because I think there are things that we have that are effect effective, but they don't get approved for a variety of reasons because they need to reduce mortality. And so that's, that's the political policy side that we won't get into. But I think some of it is because, especially as we're starting to look at sex differences and sex specific behavioral strategies, you start to see that there's different phenotypes that develop in animals that may be sensitive to certain treatments and not others. So for example, if you have animals, some animals take a ton of drug, but then are really, really sensitive to punishers. And some animals take a ton of drug and are not sensitive at all to, to punishers. So like you can't just characterize animals by how much drug they take. There's other phenotypic characteristics like are they sensitive to punishment? Are they showing compulsive behavior? How much do they take? What does the trajectory look like over time? And I think as you start to stratify these individual differences across domains, what you'll start to see is that there, there are probably targets that are going to be effect, effective in a small population, but not others. And that's actually okay. Addiction's not a singular disorder. Like we're not going to have the magic bullet for addiction. We're going to have Things where if people show comorbid depression, they may need a specific treatment. If people take drug to avoid internal states that like negative reinforcement drive, that may be a totally different circuit than people who are impulsive. And so I think that what we've kind of missed is that kind of analysis, which again, requires a lot of animals and a lot of behavioral focus to identify what the groups are and then go through and say, hey, can we now identify with we have all these genetic tools, sequencing, you know, how can we use those multifaceted data sets on the behavioral side to guide our understanding of what treatment targets would work? And I think that we're starting to have the tools to do that. And I think people are starting to do that, but it's, it's, I think it has a lot of potential. Yeah, I totally agree. And I guess if I'm hearing you correctly, um, one of the implications of what you're saying, I think is you may have two people that are both addicted, let's say even to the same drug, 
for different reasons. And so if we wanted to treat these people, there's not going to be one cure potentially, especially if we're talking about like intervening in brain circuits directly or something like that. Uh, you're going to need to have different strategies, individualized medicines, I think people call this. And I think we're very far from implementing this in medicine and probably yeah. even in a lot of our neuroscience studies. Yeah. But I would say, I just wanted to get your impression of um, one approach that I think has tried to move towards that kind of conceptualization, I'd say for the better, um, which is the RDOX. Um, uh, this is the research yeah. domain criteria um, yeah. uh, strategy for defining psychiatric disorders, basically promoted by NIMH. Um, would you, if you're familiar with it, would you, would you mind telling us what your uh, take on that is? I'm like ma marginally familiar with that, but I say uh -huh. I know everything about it. But the, but the idea, right, is that there's like there's aspects of diseases, and that we should focus on those aspects of diseases that are that are present in, in humans. And so this is. This is something that I, I, as a reinforcement person, I really like looking at different motivational drivers. So there's a lot of reasons you can be motivated to do something. And so like, for example, uh, positive reinforcement, you take something, usually reward, and you do it again because it was good. There was something good about it. But then there's also equivalent motivational drive to avoid aversive stimuli, right? And so like you say, okay, I'm going to be really motivated, but to avoid negative things in the environment. And so these kind of different strategies at baseline, which by the way, are stratified based on sex and can also drive why people take drug in different ways. So what's really cool in the human population is that women are more likely to drink to avoid depression, anxiety, social anxiety, and men are more likely to drink for impulsive reasons in a social context. Those they're both drinking, but we know that different circuits in the brain control those motivations very differently. So the question then becomes just because something looks the same, is it the same? And I think this is, you know, I think starting to get at the core of these fundamental behavioral processes, right? What can we model in a rodent? We can model negative reinforcement in a rodent. We can do that. We do that in the lab all the time. We can model appetitive motivation in a rodent. What we can't model is like, interfering with your job like a rodent doesn't have a job and i'm not going to try to in invent a rodent model of jobs and so i think really focusing on like what can we model well how do these pieces fit together and are there interactions between them i think has a lot of potential and i'm really happy to see especially nmh going in that direction saying hey we need to focus on better behavioral variables not just do four swim tests 10 times and a fear conditioning assay not that Fear conditioning is not great in a lot of contexts we do in the lab. The question is, what are you trying to show? And is it actually getting at that core behavioral phenotype? And I think sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. Right. And I, you know, the other part of the RDOC that really attracts me to that thinking is that, you know, it comes with the idea that psychiatric disorder, which, you know, currently is defined by the DSM criteria, like a list of a bunch of stuff. And if you're a num X number of those or more, then you have the disorder and you're kind of all, you're lumped in a category called a person with that disorder, um, ignoring the heterogeneity that is right there in front of you. And yeah. the RDOX approach, I think, tries to break that down into the component features that also may be measurable in animals, which is, I think, the other yeah. part of this. Um, you know, whether they always make the right distinctions in the current strategy or not, I, yeah. you know, for example, anhedonia is one of them. I'd argue that's probably not just one thing, loss of pleasure and desire, as I sort yeah. of said before. Um, but that said, I think the approach is great because anhedonia is not something that's specific to any one disorder. It's a feature of right. several disorders. And you would assume there's some underlying biology there that we could try to target specifically. Right. No, I think that that's a good idea. I think one thing as researchers we need to, to be better at, and I've written about this recently, is we try to model aspects of the disorder, but to talk how we talk about what we find is actually really important. So my favorite example, um, my lab studies fear conditioning a lot, um, not all the time, but sometimes, but fear conditioning is a really interesting paradigm, right? Like you pair a cue with an aversive stimulus, the animal freezes. So depending on what brain region you study, you will call this fear conditioning assay a test of totally different things. If you're in the hippocampus, it's learning. If you're in the amygdala, it's threat and fear. If you're in the accumbens, maybe it's salience or aversive motivation in some way. And so I think one thing is like, we are getting closer to thinking and conceptualizing these disorders in a way that's like, let's break them down to their components. But then we as researchers, I think need to be better at modeling them and not in injecting what we hope we're proving onto our studies. Like if I, I can reduce freezing a lot of ways, 
I can, if it's an auditory cue, if I make the animals deaf, I, they're going to reduce freezing to the cue. If it's, I make the animals have a cognitive problem, they're not going to learn, but though they all are decreased freezing. So, you know what I mean? You, you have these behavioral models. And the question is, are you thinking deeply about what you're, what you actually show and what are the other things that could also be driving these behavioral models in, in that way? And I think sometimes, again, I think journals like psycho farm do a really good, good job at this because the reviewers are deeply thinking about what does this mean? What is the behavior precision with wording? What did you find? We found decreased freezing. And in the discussion, you say, we hypothesize because this has been linked to fear that maybe it's fear, maybe it's threat. But I think that one of the ways we're going wrong is kind of in projecting what we want to be showing onto our behavior in animals. Yeah, I would totally agree. Um, and obviously, the, there's a, I, I don't think that we're all just sort of being disingenuous here. I think there's a human motivation to have a story that makes sense and is consistent with what you already think you know and so on. And yeah. this is the kind of thing that gets stuff into, you know, cast reviewers and stuff too, is because they're interested in the topic where if it's like a bunch of nuanced stuff and we don't really understand anything, it's kind of hard to publish that sometimes. Well, it's hard to build on. It's hard to build on. I think one of our jobs, right, as scientists, like if I discover something in my lab and I'm the only one who knows that, that doesn't help us as a community. So part of our job is the discovery, designing good experiments, but part of our job is communicating what we found and the importance and how it fits into the literature. We can all have different ideas of what that means. I think one, a good example is we just had a recent paper come out and I work in like two realms. One is dopamine and motivation, but the other, my postdoc was in a lab that did depression. And so there's this big, there was this big theory, still is, I disagree with it, that dopamine release and reward related brain reasons like the nucleus accumbens encodes reward prediction error. It signals errors in prediction for rewards. Okay, well, in the same, in a different field, stressful stimuli, aversive stimuli, increased dopamine. Those are not compatible. Like the experiments that were run were right. They showed all of these things, but there's also this other side. And so it's not that we're always saying the wrong thing or trying to be wrong. It's that sometimes we just don't have this big picture conceptualization. So, you know, with the internet, now we start to have access to these Twitter is that actually interesting. I mean, it's for good and bad sometimes, but it's a nice thing where you can publish something and someone can say, Hey, wait a minute. In my lab, we study stress and we see this and I might not see something I don't see, but like having this being okay, being wrong and saying, Hey, we thought it was this because this is all the evidence we had. But now as we start to take a bigger look, or as I start to think about behavior in a more complex way, maybe it's more complicated than that. And some of my favorite scientists in the world are people who talk about their data as the data, the data are the data. Your theory does not change what you found, but they're okay with having discussions and saying, hey, I thought it was this, but now that my lab studied this, this, and this, I think it's a little more complex. And that's how science moves forward. And I feel like Sometimes, especially younger people are afraid to be wrong, but like, that's the fun part of science. Like anytime I've been right, the paper's like the most boring paper in the world. So when I'm wrong, that they get to be really exciting. Oh, absolutely. I just <laughs> want to totally underscore that point. I could not agree more. Science almost is the process of being wrong. Like we are here studying the brain, which we do not understand. I can tell you, we are two neuroscientists, supposedly experts in this kind of stuff. We don't understand how the brain makes behavior at a, at a sort of deep level. And so, you know, the exercise that we're doing here, which I think sometimes can frustrate trainees as they're getting into it and realizing there's warts, there's caveats, there's stuff we don't quite understand. Um, you know, is, is that like, you know, you put out what you found and yeah. you make statements about it, conclusions about it, but being wrong is like almost the point. Cause like, you know, someone else is then gonna read that and say, I don't believe you. And I'm gonna prove that my, my theory is better. And if they're right, then that will be rewarded. That is what we're doing here. And so being wrong is not just an it's not just okay. It really is kind of the, the process. This is what I do doing. this in my lab. I do this in my lab. My lab members will come in and they'll be like, I have this idea. I think you're wrong. And I'm like, well, I think you're wrong. And then we like prove each other wrong. And when I'm wrong, it's like a little bit like that sucks. But at the same time, it's so exciting to see, like, I just want to know the answer. Like our job here is it to prove our theory is correct. It's to figure out the truth. Like that's the, 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 the thing. And so I think that, you know, when you think about publishing in that realm too, is I think that sometimes in some places there's this bias towards everything having to fit together. And one of the things that I really love um, when I'm thinking about publishing in journals is journals where the reviewers 
understand what science is. So if you say, hey, this is what we think is happening, but we have this data point that's inconsistent, they're not like rejected. They're like me. Let's talk about it and what the next experiments would be. And so, you know, I really like thinking about, you know, when I'm publishing too, is that like, you know what, what matters? And I know for trainees, this is hard, but it's the long game, right? It's what data is, is shaping your field. Maybe you were wrong, but that created a whole new area of research and a behavioral area. That's what matters most, not just bean counting what you did and where it went, because a lot of stuff that's not reproducible or isn't good science gets in places. And so it's more like, are you asking good questions? Are you doing it in a rigorous way? Are you talking to people in the field about it and building upon this kind of big, rich literature? And are you getting reviewers that are allowing you to not have all the answers? Because then you can move forward and you don't feel like you have to get a specific result or design experiments to prove that you're right. You design experiments to get the answer, which yeah. are sometimes one of the same, but sometimes they're not. Which is absolutely. And that's I think that's I think a role that that this journal psychopharmacology has played and, and I think will continue to play is uh, putting putting things out there you know, that are complicated, that we don't know every, all the answers, but the data, you know, there's no point in doing experiments if we don't put the data out there. That's what the taxpayers are paying us to do. And they're not paying us to solve the brain, whether they think they are or not. They're paying us to do the research and discuss this. And hopefully we will make progress, especially over the uh, the next generations. Yeah. Here. Let, me, and, uh, let me end with one thing that I think is really important for people. In your field, whatever field you're in, Go back and look at some of the most influential papers in the field, field that the drew, drove new models, new behavioral models, like progressive ratio. Oh, you know, big thing, intermittent access, behavioral economics. Go look at where, where these things are published, but then look at how much they're cited and how they're the beginning of new fields. I think that one thing we have, and it's really hard because of the internet and, and, and talking is that people think they need to have these really big comprehensive stories but some of the most impactful scientists that are out there and the impactful, most impactful work in journals like psychopharmacology are literally things that created models that then people have used for 50 years that have been cited 15,000 times. And so I think like, you know, having these conversations about like what is impactful science, impactful science isn't always finding one cell that you can turn on and off and it controls this precise behavior and you figure out what that cell did. Sometimes it's, thinking about behavior in a deep way that opens the door for other people to use models that you piloted. And I think that is something that's easily lost in a system like academia, where we're trying to get ahead and thinking about our careers. But like most of my favorite scientists literally publish in these journals and just get cited like nobody's business because their work is so influential that it's, but it's not a coffee table book thing. It's literally working out the, the inner workings of an animal's behavior and decisions. Yeah, and these, uh, I think that's a fantastic way to, uh, to end this conversation. There's, there's absolutely hope uh, for the future with, with people out there like you thinking deeply about these issues. And, and I uh, look forward to seeing, um, seeing what else you have to say about this along with your trainees in, in coming years. Thank yes, you so thanks. much, Dr. Kalapari. Thanks, this was fun. <laughs> Great, it was a pleasure.